Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Srinivas Tumalapenta. I'm a distinguished engineer at IBM. Friends, last November, a tectonic shift happened in IT industry as well as AI. AI was brought to the fingertips of everybody. ChatGPT and Google Pixel brought AI to your fingertips for accessing information as well as images correction, etc. There's been significant excitement about this, and there are also some apprehensions around the use of AI and generative AI capabilities of what it could cause to human beings. So today's conversation will be, we'll be talking about the excitement part of it, the apprehensions, so the opportunity and the risk statements of how AI and generative AI is being used by adversaries. We'll also talk about how AI can actually help and benefit the defenders, like us, from the security operations side. There's a lot of excitement around building models, building AI, using AI from a consumer standpoint. We'll also talk about how to secure that AI, and we will end with certain key takeaways. At IBM, we go through an Institute of Business Value study, and through this, we survey many CEOs and CIOs, and the excitement part of it is that 64% of the CIOs and the CEOs said that they want to adopt generative AI for the productivity benefits, as well as the speed, as well as differentiators, competitive differentiation against their competition. That's the excitement part of it. Now, on the other hand, the 84% of those CIOs and CEOs also mentioned they have concern and cybersecurity happens to be their top concern. We got some good news. The same audience said that they plan to invest in developing more advanced ways of detection and protection of the AI and of the infrastructure. So that's good news for security practitioners like us. Now is the time to protect AI. We've seen this situation in cloud adoption as well, where the businesses have adopted cloud faster then security came in as an afterthought. At least during this time, let's ensure we secure the AI upfront. As we talked about the apprehensions and, and the, and the, and the uh, adoption risks, the most important thing for AI to scale and to be used by larger population of, of uh, consumers is about trust. Trust has to be established right at the front of development of AI or usage of AI. And on an ongoing basis, we have to monitor for trust, for accuracy, for bias elimination, for hallucination elimination. We have to ensure that the AI is performing in a consistent way. That's only when consumers will trust it and will continue to use it, and that's where the industry will flourish. In order for that to happen, the top three Adoption inhibitions, uh, the barriers that we have to take care of is, we talked about cybersecurity, so how do you protect the models? How do you protect the data? How do you protect the infrastructure that is hosting? That's part of the cybersecurity aspects. There's also, in terms of usage of the data, sending the uh, information through prompts where prevention of leaking of sensitive information, privately identifiable information, all those things have to be taken care of in terms of protecting the privacy. And the third one is about accuracy. Friends, these models and these consumption elements are evolving. There's a level of accuracy issues. So take caution in terms of adopting AI while using large language models, particularly in task automation. Okay? Always have human in the loop. There's a lot of conversations around the world that are happening pertaining to regulating the AI. There is EU AI Act. The Biden administration has issued an executive order very recently. There are multiple other conversations happening around the globe, you know, around it with the new, through United Nations, through World Economic Forums. Everybody is talking about how to put guardrails and regulate AI. And the considerations are around taking a risk-based approach. The way they're looking at is it's about protecting the citizens' privacy. 
protecting the fundamental rights of the citizens, ensuring that the developers of AI and the builders of applications around AI are regulated and not AI per se, AI algorithms by itself are regulated. So this is an evolving uh, topic. As we go along, we will go get regulations and we will incorporate those regulations into our operational practices. As things prolong, there are certain threats that, are, that remain the same and some threats evolve. The way we look at the threat model is, is on the left side, where there will be conventional threats, something like exposures to the cloud, cloud security posture management, cloud misconfiguration, treating the cloud misconfiguration. That is an important aspect that still is applicable to AI as well. The second thing is some conventional threats will take new meaning where you take a DDoS attempt and the DDoS attempt is happening on a uh, ML-based application, it's trying to impact that ML-based application. It's the bad actors are trying to look into the infrastructure to steal your GPUs. So the conventional threat is taking a new meaning in this. There will always be new threats, which are like prompt injection attacks, right? data poisoning. Those will have new threats. And we got to look at all these three dimensions and formulate a new model, new threat model on this. Now, as you see, the frameworks from NIST or MITRE ATLAS are, are providing guidance upfront right now, and they are evolving. We should watch all these things, including the OS top 10. We should watch all these things and consider for current applicability and also keep an eye on adopting those uh, policies on an ongoing basis or standards on an ongoing basis as they evolve. As we look at generative AI, Generative AI makes it very easier for adversaries to create more complex attack, complicated attacks, and faster. They, are, they can improve the speed in terms of attacking the uh, infrastructure. According to IBM Threat Intelligence Index report, we, are, we have observed that a bad actor can ransomware an entire company in less than four days. Such is the speed that they'll come back with. There will be new threats, as we talked about. Prompt injection is a problem. D leaking sensitive data through the prompts will be a new uh, th uh, th threat. At the same time, while you're inferring the data and getting the data back from the LLM, there will be sensitive data and copyrighted information that could potentially come through the prompt as well as the output. Using that is an issue as well. You don't want to risk your corporate uh, uh, policy or corporate uh, uh, risk posture while using that data and cause certain legal uh, liabilities on that. As we talked about you now, stealing the models, that's a new threat as well, stealing the models, stealing the data, uh, in, encroaching into the infrastructure. These are all the things that we look at from a new threat vector standpoint. As we see, right, the adversaries are also using generative AI, and here are the different dimensions that we, uh, we, we are, they are using, and we'll talk one example at a time on these things. Deep fakes is a major problem. In this example, a voicemail was sent to a mother, the voice of the, a daughter, claiming that she, that person was kidnapped, and they were doing a kidnapping scam, about um, they're demanding a million dollars for that, for that particular situation. Such is the impact using generative AI. There are tools and services that without any technical knowledge, people can write text and ask that particular text to be rendered in a celebrity voice. There are solutions available there right now. The second thing is how adversarial services are evolving. Much like ChatGPT, there is also a warm GPT where if for 60 euros per month, this is provided as a service, and the bad actors can go use that particular service, create phishing emails, create you know, malware, create you know, code that can be embedded into, uh, into your application. So they can have malware-related aspects generated faster. So what this is uh, doing is it's bringing additional bad actors who don't need that level of a technical knowledge into the hacker community. 
and there'll be more and more attacks that are possible and complex attacks that are possible. The third example is, here is a researcher who did a 3D printing of glasses with that particular colors and has actually used that image and it tricked the AI ML to recognizing that person as this famous actress and thereby tricking the, uh, of the AI and attacking the AI. You also probably heard about autonomous vehicles getting confused when the signs on the uh, roadside were changed from, for example, 30, 30 miles per hour speed to 80 miles per hour, and the car got confused and speed up that. That's how AI is being attacked. AI is also being stolen, where the bad actors can actually go through the prompts using APIs, they can render the prompts and they can ask for a lot of sensitive information that is available as part of that LLM and use it for data, no, uh, data loss purposes. They are also using the, stealing the models which are stored in public cloud, taking them offline and using the, those models without paying any fees. So that's how models are being uh, stolen. So what do we do about it? We have to fight fire with fire. No, fire. When adversaries are using AI, so for example, they will have additional rootkits developed. We have machine learning based algorithms that are embedded into our protection technologies that should detect and remediate it faster. As we go along, we should use the generative AI for continuous testing purposes. And in, in the future, when generative adversarial networks are formed, and they use it for attack purposes and evasion purposes, we should also be able to use it for detection purposes and response purposes. Now shifting gears, we will now talk about how defenders are using AI. Now coming back to the IBM business value study, what we have observed is that 40% of the tasks that an analyst is doing is very repeatable. They do it on an ongoing basis, do the same task, come to the same outcome, so the machines can learn from that. We also observed that enterprises that invested into AI in their security operations have benefited from detecting the attack early, detecting the data breach early by 108 days. Such is the impact of AI that can help the defenders. My position is that AI should be used across the NIST cybersecurity framework. Should be used in the identify, in protect, in detect, respond, and recover. Let's talk about a few examples here. In the identify space, there are solutions like CSSM and, and uh, CASM where they're using the AI to scan the entire network, scan the entire asset inventory, and formulate clusters, formulate knowledge graphs to have a mapping of the entire IT infrastructure, hybrid cloud IT infrastructure. It's very powerful. The contextual information will be at the fingertips of the SOC analyst. In addition to that, you can also use a outside in approach and an inside out approach to understand the exposures <coughs> using attack surface management tools. You can understand the exposures from the outside and using vulnerability management by scanning tools, you can understand the exposures and the vulnerabilities from the insights, bring the data, bring information along with the asset context, learn from all this information, apply what is exploitable through weapon, weaponized exploits that are already available, take a risk-based approach, prioritize the vulnerabilities, prioritize the exposures, and remediate them. That reduces the overall exposure to your environment. It's faster. It's cheaper, it's doable. The second one is, as part of the protection, this particular capability is available in most of the EDR solutions today, where they're looking at the behavior of an attack. Using indicators of behavior, they're able to detect, now what are the processes that are being launched? They are able to predict the next process that could be launched, and that next pro if that next process is uh, deploying a particular malware or trying to encrypt certain things, it will can actually prevent that particular process to launch and kill that process and block that particular attack over there. Moving to the detect phase, and I have two examples here. In an identity access management tool, the identity 
provider pre-authentication is able to set up a baseline learning from the behavior of a user where they, how are they clicking the screen, What's, you know, uh, what, what places, what login steps that they tend to take, how, what is the browsing history, what, what, uh, where they, which particular browser they are using, which location they are coming from. They're establishing a baseline. When some things, a bad actor comes in and tries to authenticate into that application, there's a deviation to that baseline. The protection device here, the detection element here as part of this ID provider can now raise an alert saying that an anomaly has happened and some action needs to be taken on that. In addition to that, at the SIM infrastructure level where there are correlation rules that are created mapping to MITRE TTP using natural language process, you can do the analysis of the coverage and say, here is what you're covered for the MITRE TTPs and if a new attack is coming in, you can ask a question whether am I covered for this particular attack or not. You can understand the delta where the coverage is required. You can then put the rules that are applicable for that particular attack so you can put the detection strategies faster so that you can detect it and protect your environment. In addition to that, the rules are also created in a way that they are duplicate in nature because rules are created over a period of time, it probably will be created by multiple, uh, multiple people, and it is causing impact on the systems. It's also generating low value alerts, uh, potentially. So using natural language processing again, you can analyze it, identify the duplicates, and then remove the duplicate and make your system that much better. And in the response phase, we have used this particular technique as part of our security operation systems, where we have used four machine learning algorithms, where three are the foundation models and one is an ensemble model, where the machine learning algorithms learn from the telemetry, 30 different platform types, technology types, no security technology types. It learned from 30 different attributes of telemetry, the alert uh, attributes. It learned from that. It also learned from the analyst behavior if a particular alert came through in a, in, uh, to, to this, what would be the analyst action on it? And the analyst would typically analyze that particular alert for five or 10 minutes, and the analyst would say, I'm closing this because this is low value. I'm uh, associating it because there's an existing ticket I've already available. I'm uh, escalating it because this is a high value alert, immediate action needs to be taken, and the analyst escalates it. What we have done is we have put machine learning to task on to learn all this telemetry, learn the analyst behavior, and that's a training, a trained model, pre-trained model. And as part of a prediction, when a new alert comes in, this goes into this uh, pre-trained model, and the model will provide a prediction saying that with 90% or more confidence, I will predict this as closure, or association, or escalation. Right? We have taken that 90% threshold to automate those tasks, and then we have gained about 70% of alert automation without any human intervention. Such is the power of AI that we can employ as part of security operations. This helped us in two ways. It helped us to reduce the noise to, to the uh, analyst, so they have better job satisfaction now. It also helped us to automate it and remediate, uh, respond to the uh, actions faster, so our mean time to response reduced as well. Now shifting gears to how do we secure AI? Right? So my point, position is that AI is consumed in three different ways. AI will be hosted on hybrid cloud, it will have platforms. There will be platforms from Google, from uh, Azure, from IBM. And there will be an overall governance around it in to, to, to provide data management, to provide uh, security operations and ethics, not trustworthy AI. There will be model ecosystems where there are models that are uh, publicly available. There could be open source models or that some vendor provided models that the clients can bring in. The first consumption model, as you see on the picture, is something like a chat GPT, where the user is going and accessing the model without any kind of training. They're just consuming it from an inference standpoint. The second model is there are models available from the model ecosystem. They're bringing the model into their private environment, and the client, would, the enterprise, would tune it for their usage 
and they will use it for inference purposes. And the third model, a consumption model is, a enterprise will bring in open source model, open data, they'll bring it in, they will develop a custom model on top, uh, from it, they will use their own data to train it, and then use it for inference purposes. These are the three consumption models. We recommend a security framework for this. At the bottom of the framework, it's about governance, risk, and compliance. How do you enhance the existing policies, the corporate policies, identify the standards that are available, identify the best practices that are available, take the information from them, enhance the current policies, enhance your governance structure, build a governance structure and enhance your governance structure to govern the AI deployments in your enterprise. The second one is securing the infrastructure. And this goes, you can apply zero trust principle to this. This is about securing your hybrid cloud infrastructure, ensuring there are no misconfigurations in your cloud, ensuring your, you have DDoS prevention uh, at your infrastructure level, at your boundary controls, ensuring application uh, security, ensuring identity and access management that forms under that securing the infrastructure. Then on top of it, you have how do you secure the data that, that you're using for training purposes, how do you secure the models that you have either homegrown or coming from a vendor ecosystem, and how you're securing the entire usage of this particular AI-based application overall and monitoring on an ongoing basis. Bringing this together, here's what we see happening. There will be businesses, business use cases, that will be uh, that where AI will be applicable. Within those business use cases, we have security use cases, and the security use cases will be to enhance the analyst experience. Jason Flood talked about talked about it in the previous session. Identify new threats. Improve the mean time to uh, uh, respond and mean time to detect. I talked about an example on that. Identifying fakes. So these are multiple use cases from a security business, uh, security standpoint. While we are doing that, the attackers are also using, and we talked about the threats about phishing attacks being generated through AI, deep fakes being generated through AI, malware being generated, and data, potential data poisoning. Securing the AI is in between these two. I look at it this as this eight fundamental principles of how to secure the AI. And it doesn't matter which form factor, which consumption model that you're talking about, this is about providing a holistic picture of strategy and governance. You have identity and access management controls to secure that AI. You have infrastructure security, you have data protection. You have trustworthy AI, where AI quality is important because if AI accuracy and performance is dropping, there is a likely chance that there is some problem with the data, some problem with the training. Maybe the, the, the uh, data was poisoned, right? So we got to ensure that there is tracking and audit auditability, traceability and auditability of the models and the data in order for trustworthy AI to be generated. Your DevSecOps pipeline will be expanding. What will happen is, you are now building the models, and the models will depend on the uh, data, which is uh, used for training purposes. After the model is built, you will have an inference API. You're expanding your application stack to incorporate that particular API into your application. Now your application is talking through that API to, to go talk to the large language model or a machine learning algorithm to get the output and use it as part of the application processes. So you have to expand your Dev DevSecOps processes. Education and awareness is a very, very important thing. We have to ensure that the end users understand what data they could use, how they could use, what to do, and what not to do. In addition to that, when you're talking about threat management, as we understand there are new models, new attack types and attack vectors are coming up, there have to be new detection strategies that needs to be generated 
that needs to be deployed into a security operations and then you have to be able to detect and respond to them with appropriate response playbooks tailored made for detecting the attacks on AI. So these are the eight, eight key recommendations. So by applying all these existing security best practices, we can get a head start on securing the AI. Right? We've talked about these eight principles in the previous one. The first part of it is getting trusted AI by evaluating the vendor policies, whether you're using ChatGPT or op OpenAI or other things, the vendors have a policy about, we will use your prompts for learning purposes. Be very cautious about it. If you're bringing the model from a vendor ecosystem uh, to, to into your environment, understand who developed the model, what data they used, what uh, intellectual property that data may have, did they inspect for it, what uh, indemnification that they're providing, understand all those things before you adopt that particular model. In addition to that, you can also look at generating a threat model on top of it, that your AI uh, pipeline uh, is now embedded into a DevSecOps pipeline, enhance your threat model as well on that. Rest of the points I touched on the previous slide as well. Here are the key ta takeaways. There are existing policies, existing standards that are available. Learn from them and use them to enhance your compliance and security controls at the moment. PII data cannot be used for training your models. You can also not send PII data through prompts. Put adequate scanning methodologies as part of your analyzing your training data set, also analyzing your prompt injection, and see if any PII is being sent there, prevent that PII is being, uh, is being sent. Apply new detection strategies for AI and also have response playbooks. Last but not the least, you enhance your SOC operations with data science skills, with prompt engineering skills. Prompt engineering will become an important skill, and then enhance your skills with the, the enhance the soft skills of your analysts as well. Okay. With that, we conclude today's session. And if you have any questions available, please. Yep, we have a few. So first. What new skills should a security operations team learn to use generative AI effectively? As I mentioned uh, uh, in the last uh, point, prompt engineering skills will be the most important skills. They'll be used for inference purposes as well as task automation purposes. Right? So that's one of the most important skills. Second one is soft skills will be important. Third one is being aware of data science methodologies, models, ML models, will give them a head start in terms of understanding what is coming through into security operations when AI is being applied for them. All right, and then one more. What precautions should we take when using automation based on generative AI? When we use uh, generative AI as part of the automation, there are accuracy issues within, you know, that uh, as we infer, the, uh, infer from the large language models, the output may not necessarily be accurate. If you're taking a chaining model where you're taking the output from one inference, one prompt to another uh, in, as an input to an, another prompt, and if the information is not accurate, you're causing an impact, a cascading effect down the line where the results ultimately for the entire transaction will be inaccurate. So ensuring that there is a human in the loop to assess the accuracy of the information you know, trusting that particular AI over, uh, initially and as well as on an ongoing basis, having auditors in place and human in loop is very important. All right, thanks, that's all the questions I have. All right, thank you very much.